President Biden gave a speech in Madison, Wisconsin earlier today in which he humiliated Donald Trump and gave a major update about the future of his candidacy and his campaign after days of speculation. But before we unpack all that, if you end up liking this video and you want to support the channel, please be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and alert bells before you go. All right, friends, we have several clips to talk about in this video, and the protagonist in all of these clips is President Joseph Robinette Biden. We're going to deal with the best parts first, or at least the most fun parts first, which is President Biden roasting Donald Trump about an iconic gaffe Trump made a few years ago. We're going to play the clip from Biden and then play the clip from Trump to which Biden is referring. Folks, did you have a good 4th of July? By the way, if you wonder whether Trump has it all together, did you ever hear how he explained the 4th of July when he was president? No, I'm serious. This is true. His explanation how America won the Revolutionary War? I'm not making this up. He said in his 4th of July speech five years ago, he said, George Washington's army won the revolution by taking control of the airports from the British. <laughs> to talk about me misspeaking. Airports of the British in 1776. Again, this is pretty funny, and believe it or not, it is true. It's easy to forget about all the crazy, stupid things that Donald Trump has said over the years because he's graded on a curve and because he's assailed us with like an endless barrage of unhinged moments. But it is true. In fact, when Donald Trump was the president of the United States, he gave a scripted teleprompter included speech uh, celebrating the 4th of July. And this is what he had to say about then General Washington uh, and the Revolutionary War. In June of 1775, the Continental Congress created a unified army out of the revolutionary forces encamped around Boston and New York and named after the great George Washington Commander-in-Chief. The Continental Army suffered a bitter winter of Valley Forge, found glory across the waters of the Delaware, and seized victory from Cornwallis of Yorktown. Our army manned the airport. It ran the ramparts. It took over the airports. It did everything it had to do. <laughs> again, anybody could misspeak, anybody, myself included. I'm just saying, again, if this is the standard that we're going to hold President Biden to, we're obligated to do the same thing to Donald Trump or any presidential candidate. It's just it is funny. Obviously, aviation didn't exist at the time of the revolution. And, and, and any time Donald Trump references uh, George Washington, it's always interesting to me because, again, as I've noticed, I I have repeatedly said that President Washington is the most important and greatest American president, despite his many faults. As a matter of fact, I'd recommend this book by historian Alexis Coe called You Never Forget Your First, in which she discusses uh, Washington's successes as a general, as a president, as a statesman, and also his many, many pitfalls, failures, military, political, and moral. It is an unapologetic, brute force look at uh, probably the most important American in the history of our country. But what I find so interesting about that before we get into the other clips of Biden is, of course, Washington embodied the Cincinnati principle of relinquishing power. He gave up his commission when he was general of the Revolutionary War, or rather the Continental Army of the Revolutionary War, he had all the military at his disposal. He could have staged a coup. He could have overthrown the Continental Congress and declared himself King George I, having successfully overthrown King George III of Great Britain, and he chose not to. And at the end of his second term as president, he again resigned. He could have ran again and would have almost certainly won again and again and again until he died. He could have been president for life. And instead, he chose not to. And that was before the 22nd Amendment, which required presidents to no longer seek office after they served two terms successfully. Again, that's the standard that Washington embodied. And he was the one who came up with the peaceful transfer of power and Donald Trump violated it. But with all that in mind, I want to play the next clip of President Biden in which these next two clips where he addresses, he gives a major campaign update, which for better or worse should end days, if not weeks of speculation about its future. The most important, we're going to save our democracy. Now, now you probably heard, we had a little debate last week. Can't say it was my best performance. We love it, Tom. But ever since then, there's been a lot of speculation. What's Joe going to do? Is he going to stay in the race? Is he going to 
to drop out, what you going to do? Well, here's my answer. I am running and going to win again. Now, again, I've got another clip to show you on that score. But again, that should end the speculation, whether you agree with it or not. And I know some people don't, but the president is the presumptive nominee and he's going to stay in the race. I, he also addressed, you know, the weakness of his per first performance. But uh, as he'll say, I believe in this clip, you know, he's not going to let 90 minutes wipe out three and a half years of just objectively good governance. The city president of the United States of America, no small part because of you. Not, not a joke in 2020. You came through for me. I'm a nominee of the Democratic Party. I'm a nominee of this party because millions of Democrats like you just voted for me in primaries all across America. You voted for me to be your nominee. No one else. You, the votes, the voters did that. And despite Despite that some folks don't seem to care who you voted for, well, guess what? They're trying to push me out on the race. No. Well, let me say this as clearly as I can. I'm staying in the race. Yeah. I'll beat Donald Trump. I will. So again, making it abundantly clear that he is staying in the race. Now, as he points out, you know this idea that, well, people say I'm too old, but was I too old? to deliver the great performance in the White House that I have. And he goes through his list, at least it's not even a comprehensive list, otherwise he'd probably be up there for hours at a time. But he reminds people that he wasn't too old to deliver some major accomplishments for the American people. And I and you are not finished yet. And you probably also noticed a lot of discussion about my age. I know I look 40. I keep seeing all those stories about I'm being too old. Let me say something. I was too old. I wasn't too old to, I wasn't too old to create over 15 million new jobs. To make sure 21 million Americans are insured under the Affordable Care Act. To be big farmer, the first time I ever do that, and lower the cost of this to $35 per season. Well, they're too old to relieve student debt for nearly 5 million Americans in growth economy. Too old to put the first black woman on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. To sign the Respect for Marriage Act. Well, they're too old to sign the most significant gun safety law in 30 years. To pass the biggest climate bill in the history of the world, not here, the history of the world. But then my critics say, sure, but he did all that. But that was in the past. What about now? Well, how about the 200,000 jobs we announced yesterday? So let me ask you, what do you think? You think I'm too old to restore Roe v. Wade to law of the land? You think I'm too old to ban assault weapons again? No. To protect Social Security and Medicare? No. Again, excellent argument from President Biden about his record. And again, he didn't even give everything because we'd just been there all day. But he addressed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which is the biggest piece of gun safety legislation in 30 years. And it was bipartisan. He addressed the Inflation Reduction Act, which had the biggest investment in recorded history, in human history in combating climate change. He addressed the, Re the Respect for Marriage Act, right, which codified gay marriage protections into federal law, given that the Supreme Court, in their Dobbs decision, when they overturned Roe v. Wade, signaled that they might go after Obergefell, which is the Supreme Court decision which protected gay marriage rights. If they repeal that, or if they overturn that, and there's no reason to believe this court wouldn't do it, there would be nothing stopping red states from outlawing gay marriage as they are wont to do. But President Biden preempted that and Democrats passed the Respect for Marriage Act. And again, we could talk about the inflation or the uh, infrastructure law, the bipartisan infrastructure law, something that Donald Trump promised that he would get done in four years. Biden got it done in less than one. That's an apples to apples comparison. The 15 million jobs. I mean, he mentioned President Biden mentioned that there were 200,000 jobs, I think 206,000, as a matter of fact added to the United States economy 
on his watch. And we will do a video about that. I was going to bring a, a clip up, but I'll save it for the, for the video that we're going to do about that. But his, I think his point is just objectively true. And no centrist or conservative wants to address it. At least people who have questions about the president on the left or in the Democratic Party have it from a position of good faith. But Republicans and centrists, they want to make everything about this 90 minute debate, ignoring how terribly Trump performed with his manifold lies during the debate. And they never want to talk about record. We're not electing the debater, the president of the United States debate club, right? We are electing the president of the United States, a chief executive, a head of state, a head of government, an executive. Somebody who participates in the legislative process, who initiates legislation through his proxies, through his political party, and signs it into law. And Biden's record is just objectively better than Trump's. And I've made this case before. Even if you take the value propositions, let's say you're a conservative and you hate that everything that Biden has done, because everything Biden has done has involved some sort of progressive change or climate reform or the expenditures of, of tax money, whatever it is, I'll say you hate the legislation. But the fact that that was part of a stated goal, he had a stated goal to pass infrastructure, he had a stated goal to address climate change, and he got it done and Trump didn't. The fact that Biden got more of his goals accomplished by far than Trump did, that is a measure of executive competence. And Biden is just objectively by far better. And no conservative or centrist can contend with that. Last thing I want to point out, just Thinking of the reason that the president gave the speech and the exhaustive commentary that we've been getting from not just right wing media, but mainstream media. There is a guy by the name of David Roberts. I think he is a climate like he's an environmentalist specifically. Yeah, I run a newsletter podcast called Volts about clean energy and politics. He was he came to my attention when he was interviewed by Chris Hayes on MSNBC months ago. And I really like I really like what he has to say, particularly on Twitter. He says, preventing a fascist takeover of the U.S. is my top priority. As a journalist, as a voter, as a human, if it isn't yours too, you should feel bad about yourself. If you haven't made the stakes of this election clear to everyone within the sound of your voice, you should feel bad. And as a matter of fact, he goes into more detail. I haven't written much about politics since the debate, mainly because I'm so overwhelmed by disgusting contempt towards this country's media and commentariat that has rendered me inarticulate with rage. Twitter probably doesn't need more rage. I just want to make one point, though. And he goes into detail, and that's part of the thread that, that in which he says that his top priority is to defeat fascism. And this should be the case for all of us. At the end of the day, President Biden has announced that he is running for re-election. Whatever misgivings that you may have about that, he's just objectively better than Trump. So for those of you who do have misgivings about it, I'm asking you at this point to set them aside and rally behind the president with an objectively superior record, with an enormously competent cabinet uh, and people under him who are affecting his policy, who are executing his policy, particularly when the Supreme Court of the United States effectively made the president of the United States a God King. That power is not going to be easily reversed. We actually have to defeat the Supreme Court to do it. We have to change the court. We have to pack the court. We have to change the court fundamentally to disarm the presidency. And until that happens, a Republican can't win the presidency. We have to defeat the Republican every damn time, particularly somebody like Donald Trump. And so I'm with David Roberts about this. I agree with him. At the end of the day, preventing a fascist takeover should be the number one priority of everyone. Now, right wing media and Republicans, it's not going to be their number one priority because they support the fascist, in this case, Donald Trump. But if you're a centrist, if you're a member of the mainstream media, then your focus should be honest. And if your focus is hyper fixated on Joe Biden's 90 minutes of debate, that's dishonest. It's irrational. And you should feel bad about yourself. Let me know what you think in the comments.